Welcome everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our lecture five on parallel programming with OpenMP. And this means we change a little bit the view from distributed memory programming that we had the last time to something we called shared memory programming that we had already a little bit introduced at the beginning of the course. Um, in many applications that you have today, obviously you combine both worlds, you would say distributed computing and distributed programming specifically can be combined with shared memory programming, which so to speak leads to hybrid programming, a very complex endeavor in parallel computing, but of course also can meet a lot of performance for applications. <clears throat> but before we dive into the material of shared memory, let us review what we had the last time. And the last time we really dived more in the idea what MPI is, and of course this means the distributed memory programming. Um, we had this already in lecture two, in practical lecture 2.1 with collectives, with send receive operations, and lecture four was building on that in principle, but then also extending that to, to different areas, which are very relevant for many different applications. And one of the areas we touched upon was essentially the idea of blocking versus non-blocking communication. And with this, you already also have here and there some insights about this so-called term load imbalancing, right? So this is an important word where basically you see that one processor is perhaps waiting too long, being idle, don't do anything, while the other processor is very busy. And this is usually not a good principle to do because the systems are very costly. And if you scale high with the application and Many of the cores are idle and don't have anything to do because they're essentially just waiting. Uh, that's not a good idea. And we illustrated this a little bit as load imbalance at the same time also showing you a little bit what this non-blocking operation means. Here's one example out of this lecture where we said a typical blocking operation, blocking in the sense that when basically this, this kind of two um, processors that you see here right on the live line, if you want over time, uh, want to communicate, the first processor is doing an MPI send and then basically is trapped inside this message as long as the time it takes to get the receive from the corresponding other processor. Now, this is all fine and works nicely. And there are some improvements of non-blocking communication we will discuss. Here in this context, however, you see a good example of this idea of this waiting time, so to speak where the second processor was already far earlier, ready to receive, but nothing happens, right? <clears throat> and also with blocking um, communication here on this side, MPI receive, a normal MPI operation, you would start basically that the second processor here with its lifeline will jump into this operation and then basically has nothing to do. Just waiting, and then suddenly the MPI send is coming. Obviously, there should be always a certain amount of waiting time. Nobody can program it so perfectly that perhaps this will match directly like we have seen in the example of ping pong. But um, we see here that this is, would be now something which if you scale, scale the code high and you have many of these waiting operations, it's not good. So <clears throat> some solutions that you can basically do in this context would be to introduce a certain amount of non-blocking communications to overlap essentially computing with communication a little bit more and things like that, that we basically also described in the last time. Um, here you see now this non-blocking communication called I receive, um, which means after the second processor here is going into this particular operation, after it, it will continue to do elements. Right, so the I receive has been basically performed. You can do a lot of different aspects, and then um, you initiate an MPI wait operation on this receive, and still have, of course, here some waiting time, which is not good. But you can maybe use this time here in between for optimizing and doing some other computation and so forth. However, there should be a synchronization that we learned at the end with MPI wait, that then basically wait really for all matching sent and receives because chances are that we here it will do a loop now and do the next time step of the scientific application that we discussed in context, let's say wave propagation and so forth. So essentially that rounds up a big chunk of MPI communication elements, where in this course particularly, we will not dive into much more of this. 
Um, some of these elements will come more in Reza's part in the CFD special at the end of the course, or basically at the second part of the course. But here we will carry on also with shared memory programming, still take away the message that this is, of course, incredibly useful. Also useful in MPIA operations um, is really, in many applications, the idea of a Cartesian communicator. And this was also what we had the last time. We had the MPI com world, and basically this was a world of all processes, and we have learned we can not only split, basically, this particular MPI com world in different pieces, which you see here, let's say in four different equal chunks, and they basically get a new rank assigned that you see here, and then can communicate within these processors um, with a, as we basically have learned with the MPI com world, instead of the MPI com world, you would basically have then these groups for communication. But what was really powerful the last time was the idea of this Cartesian communicator, right? So basically a Cartesian grid that you have here, three times four. And basically we see in many of these applications, like what you would say with wave propagations right across the ocean, right? Consider that this is a domain of an ocean. And we just decide that should be three times four divided among all the processors that I have that fits nicely, perhaps, uh, depending here of the ranks that you see with 12 processors. And these should basically do a wave propagation of an ocean, right? Simulate an ocean. And we have seen there's some certain configuration parameters like periodic, so that you basically start again with the top, which you probably want if you want to have a real ocean, not suddenly should the wave stop. And you see also this kind of iterative behavior. And with these <clears throat> time steps, always with this kind of next and next part and next part, you also see that basically this should basically be a paradigm that every one is doing the same thing. Every one of these um, you see in all the ranks, basically doing this time step zero, time step one, time step two, time step three, time step four. And you see the certain shift over the domain space. This could be the wave propagation. It could be boats that all fly, basically go here in parallel. So it could be fishing population. There are different ways how you actually can think about it and must not be at all water. It could be any other domain that you think about. Now, the trouble that you run into as a programmer would be then, how do I know which basically is the rank that I want to communicate to? And basically, how do I know where basically I get and receive some information from? Right. So this is something where you see here now that this is beautifully supported as Cartesian coordinator, um, co uh, communicator. So basically saying that you have the different ranks, but you also get obtained some information about when I want to do a shift in a certain area or direction. I basically obtain this from the Cartesian communicator itself in order to be able to do and perform then the send receive for the shift uh, that I really want. And this could be a send receive, so basically not only in one direction, right, which this suggests is more a send, 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 could be also send and receive, but there are many options. And we looked at some of the application examples also in the last time. So by rounding up the idea of communications a little bit before we moved then to IO, or basically also was alluding a little bit to IO directly, we learned that this communication Hardware is very important for basically the HPC applications. And this is best reflected in this Cartesian. If you think about this, you do this a million times to simulate the waves over the ocean. You see that always something needs to be sent over the wire. As we know, it's not shared programming or shared memory programming. <clears throat> it's distributed memory programming. That means we always send something. And by sending, we use the basically fabric of the interconnects that we have here. And by basically from processor to processor, depending on which topology we have available at the systems, uh, we learned that there were some uh, like basically the one with the fat tree networks, but also very modern ones like the dragonflies. Um, still, the bottlenecks that you often observe is in the price. Um, the price performance ratio is, of course, in the network, a very important consideration, because if you want, this is one of the most expensive parts of the HPC machine, the switches, the InfiniBand cables, connections, right, that basically interconnect then um, the compute nodes, which uh, basically compute a lot and, of course, then have data a lot in their memories in order to be dropped to disks at some point in time. 
Um, or if you want to communicate with another part in the compute nodes, you also need to have the switches partly as we understood. Now coming more to the idea um, then why um, also IO needs to be considered a little bit more, especially if you scale up. Um, and we had in lecture three nice examples to scale up really highly. If you remember with speed up graphs up to 500,000 cores. Now you can imagine if all of these cores communicate and some of them are maybe recognized as IO nodes. So they perform then basically the drop to disks. Um, it still needs that some computing processor maybe needs to take the bandwidth from many connections on the way to the IO node in order to dump it to disk via a switch. And this is a bit another idea how you can see it. And you see clearly here the bottleneck in the switches, lots of storage, not so expensive these days, computing also not so expensive these days, uh, still the, the fabric of the interconnects to really interconnect every compute node with every compute node completely and then properly with the file service is still the main bottleneck. It really costs a lot. Hence, people oversubscribe, as you have seen in the Fat Tree network, or do things like regional communication combined with global communication, what would be the summary in one respect, basically, with this dragonfly ideas. So basically, um, this alluded already to the idea that um, when I now, as an application developer, want to use this all, and want to communicate between the compute nodes. We have seen from memory to memory very easily. We do basically the send receive, the collective operations and non-blocking communications. We have learned new, we do proper communicators. What we left out so far uh, was then basically the IO part, which we then also continue to look at in lecture four. Hence, now we're talking about more the idea, how can MPI support the drop from memory in the distributed memory computing here? to disks, right? So we want, of course, to store when we have a million iterations of the oceans with the wave propagation, and we want to know in each time step the wave height, we have lots of data that we want to store that was kept in memory, was computed. Maybe sometimes people even do uh, something we call basically just having a, a kind of short, um, you know, step in between saved, or let's say you would say every 20 runs you want to do basically a, a kind of drop to disk. And this is something which, of course, now brings in the topic of IO. And then we learned that this could be also basically causing several load imbalancing problems if you do it not properly. And one of the things that come immediately to mind as you basically as a human would program it maybe in the first place would be, let's let, do all processes, uh, you know, perform some computing, and then, you know, just one we select, and that should be the one that drops everything to file, right? And this is also for us forward thinking, um, because in a way, when we do our own laptop, we are not even allowed to open a file several times, right? Or basically, you can open it several times, but not edit several times at the same time. You will get a lock problem, right? And say, this is already used by another thread or by another process. Hence, what could be the solution? You think basically, oh, it's nice to do rather than something like every process should actually just do a, their own copy of the data, right? So the wave height that I compute here with the 12 ranks, with 12 processes, everybody has the timestamp on the wave height as an example to each of the periods of time. And I saw this locally. So I end up on the disk basically here instead of having one file created by one processor, one big file, I would have many of those. Now, there are two problems with this. The first one that you see here is obviously when I just say one master should do all of this, you see basically here, this space, all the processors would idle around and waiting just for the IO to finish from this perfect master. So already a, a pointer, so to speak, for load imbalancing, especially if you now think you don't want to have five processors, you want to have 12, like in this Cartesian, or even as we have seen in the examples from lecture three, basically covering maybe 500,000 processes, right? Or 500,000 cores roughly. So this means a long awaiting time and basically a not scalable approach. And the same is actually true more or less for this. You would say with a moderate amount of courses may still work, but it quickly can cause contention in the file system, like for instance, inodes, because you have lots of different small files that will be generated, 
and you still have the file system doing all the management of all of these inodes or basically metadata about the file if you want the entries in the file systems which cause the file system not to do that very quickly so you waste a lot of io time again to create all these little files hence the solution what you do in power computing is something we call parallel io and this is a very special technique supported by parallel file systems that specifically support the concurrent access to files right and this is now something that you can't really do on your laptop if you notice if you open it twice um, you will see directly there's a lock hence there's some consistency semantics which are a little bit more relaxed and um, you see that a little bit here how it now looks basically we have the same situation that there will be one big file but the strategy is that every process so basically every process in the game is writing to a very specific part in this file right so it's not like this that just one process is writing all of them are writing almost at the same time to one part in this data and of course this directly raises alarm bells right when i just do this let's say not really in a very good fashion then i do overrides i write the same things at the same position hence there are certain pointers that avoid this and to really scale up then to a many many you know different processes where all the different threads would think about writing in one file you can imagine this big big chunk of file is just a theory in a way it's basically just a logical file where the processes will write in but how it really is distributed again because we talk about still having hpc with distributed io nodes distributed storage would be often a two level mapping so you see the logical file is then on the physical hard drives and so on further striped as we call that uh, with different striping options that you can do but this is also something you can then review back in lecture four um i just note the end of this also i think because it's very important to summarize mpi here also for open mp that's why i spend a little bit more time on this um basically you think about that in the future we see the storage like network attached memory or more hierarchies like using maybe also something we call bucket stores so as part of the storage so basically not anymore this just parallel io but maybe combining it is something what we also do in admire and other research projects where we try to have this bottleneck of storage if you want these days especially if you're extremely scale high somehow let's say um, created with new technology it goes beyond the teaching here but of course people have realized that this is really something uh, today which is hindering us in new performance but it's now also time to come to open mp again i think it's worse to repeat a lot of mpi now to really differentiate it with open mp which we learn now today and the idea is really to think about parallel and serial regions you will notice that shared memory programming if you want is a little bit easier we have certain fork and joints we have loops that we can parallelize with so-called um, compiler directives so the open mp standard is quite nice and enables again portability similar like the mpi standard and we look a little bit in then in the cutting edge ideas how you use now open mp in practice you would see hybrid programming again combining it with mpi but then also where the basically more current situation in cutting edge codes goes to uh, is more a task based view and one of the reasoning is that also of course the accelerators which you will learn more and more in lecture six as well but you have learned it already a little bit abstractly that you know we have not only anymore just cpus we have gpus as well and you have different tasks on both devices in a way and you need to manage this wisely to do the best performance so there are basically more and more um, ideas of using openmp and other ideas um, for more task-based executions and this is not obvious to you we will see how that materializes when we come to the end of part one in part two then we want to dive a little bit to the practice of this we have like an mpi the parallel programming basic building blocks if you want how to do shared memory in practice uh, we learn a little bit about local and shared variable types some application examples on the way and as we always modify the same uh, shared memory space you can imagine to avoid basically uh, bad updates or lost updates as it's sometimes called um, we basically have critical regions and serial regions uh, 
where we basically have some synchronization constructs um, that helps us to better work with shared memory. And then, of course, we go again into some comparisons with MPI, understanding this a bit better, performance issues, and some application examples on the way. So much more uh, idea of basically also um, uh, programming an HPC system, but different than MPI, right? So basically also here we think about scalable computing, very data intensive networks and uh, workloads, but the um, power programming in a way is based on the shared memory, so in a way limited. Uh, on the other hand, you have seen already, and I was alluding to, you can combine it with MPI, and that makes it then extremely complex programming. So I would say even for the beginner, I would not recommend to do MPI programming in context of uh, OpenMP. At least if you are starting, uh, basically start with MPI. And then once your application scales highly, then you can optimize with OpenMP within the node. Hence, with this, what you get out of this particular lecture, again, you get more and more programming skills through this. Um, since we changed a little bit the course, we don't do much um, basically on OpenMP and the assignments. Um, and with this, we basically would have um, the later examples from Razor uh, part basically of all these CFD applications. So let's start with shared memory programming concepts. We basically had a couple of those um, ideas already when we talked a bit how this works really in terms of how it would look like on the hardware level. You see here some shared memory, which is a uniform memory access, uh, the UMA and then the non-uniform memory access. Uh, where there's still a bus interconnect, but for us it's important that as developers we still see it as a shared memory, right? So basically there's a protocol um, that has this cache currency so that we basically see this as all one memory space, although it's basically, you know, as you see a distributed one, but it doesn't look like this. These are two very important ones, the UMA and the CC NUMA. Uh, that you basically can program still with OpenMP because we have all access to one shared memory space. And this is a key difference, if you remember, to distributed computing, uh, distributed memory. Um, another example of change of wording and terminology is also reflected in this, if you noticed. In MPI, we usually talk about processes, right, that are somehow the ranks that do some work. And in shared memory, you talk usually about threats that doing something on the space of shared memory. And this is an important part, more or less a more lightweight process if you want. So <clears throat> with this, we don't have to review this so intensively. Again, uh, another view on this UMA architecture. Um, important is that we still have all the different levels of cache and so on at each of the different processes involved but they basically have some interesting chipset access to the shared memory address space, um, which we have in UMA basically directly connected to these processes and which is a key difference, um, which we have with the CC NUMA, which you see here, where basically you have the same level of catches. You have the memory interface directly connected to the cache for some of the processes, but the other processes are a little bit only linked with the cache current land network. Um, and then basically, of course, have access to their own ones. How, however, it basically still is a logical, right? They, we call that the logical address space of the shared memory is still for us developers the same, right? So this is now important. It's a single address space if you want of physically distributed memory, but we don't care about, and now I'm repeating myself again, I think, to say for us developers, it looks like one shared or single address space we can work on. And this is convenient, right? So because that enables us to much more abstract again from the real, real hardware and the chips and so on to some certain degree so that we don't care anymore about if I now address particular this memory space or this memory space, this is all given to us by this single uh, logical address space. And this enables us a lot of interesting elements to review a little bit what I mean with shared address space. I think it should be more or less clear if you have listened to Computer Science 101 uh, that we offer in the university. I think shared address and spaces, shared memory is a little bit touched upon to some degree how basically threads even in operating systems will operate on this shared data. You see a little bit here an example again 
we have two threads and uh, basically a variable here, which we basically have initiated with 23. And basically you see that um, I can put that in a kind of shared memory space. And we then have the, the thread two that actually is using this data now, as you see here, A can simply use um, the information that we have in the shared data in order to do some other operation A plus one, which makes it then 24. So in other words, you see how that could look in UMA and CC NUMA a little bit like this, if you have thread one and thread two, right? So thread one puts it somewhere in the memory and thread two can read from the same memory does its operation and is basically done with it. Um, the same, as I said, with a single address space here, um, or single logical address space, I should say, of this distributed memory, um, you basically would write it, but the cache current protocol will ensure that basically the second thread here uh, will also be able to read from this memory and then um, essentially be able to compute. Hence, um, this is still very much straightforward um, for us as developers to have access to the whole address space. Um, however, you can see already this is a very trivial example. If you have now very many variables and you basically want to read from this variable as this particular fellow here, um, then you have to, have to also think that at some point in time, um, maybe you overwrite at the wrong time this particular variable. So we have to have a more common sense about the status of the variables. That's why I'm getting it. And at which time you want to use them actually for computing something. And this would be one of the challenges probably that you come in once you have OpenMP more used. So OpenMP, I talked much about it. What is it? It is basically a API specification of different um, elements that we need for programming. Here we don't have explicit message exchange functions like we would have an MPI, right? Obviously, we don't really need a send receive or a broadcast or a non-blocking operation because we have the same address space. The same address space means I can conveniently access the variables that are in my address space from the memory and access it. I can write on it, read on it. That's what I want. And this is what OpenMP is now working on. Obviously, we have some work sharing to do with all the different threads. So we still want to do parallel programming, what this lecture is actually about, right? So still, this means we have to have some working construct, how you maybe break a big problem into smaller pieces, like let's say a very long for loop, for example, and also basically how you do a little bit this kind of idea um, of synchronizing between them. So in this respect, um, we basically would have, um, you know, not anymore the way of programming like MPI, but much more, let's say, on a small scale, thinking about loops, more granular on one specific aspect of the application where I can tune elements. And in some point in time, this becomes maybe a, a serial part, and then suddenly you realize, okay, I can do some parallel programming here, like the for loop, so break that up into different threads, something we call spawning different threads, and then I do the loop in parallel, and after the loop I return a little bit to serial, and then again to parallel, maybe down the road. So this is something which we basically see a little bit visualized here, right? So basically I have always a master thread, and this is the one that will basically remain in all the application, right? It's always there in an OpenMP program. What happens is if you now have a specific fork and joins in this particular application computed, um, we can kick off a parallel region, right? You see that here also more um, described where you basically have a number of threads now working on a problem, this team of threads working again together in some respect, and then at some point in time join to a serial region, and then we maybe kickstart another parallel region and so forth and so forth. So it's a programming language that is based also on lots of compiler directives, right? So in this sense, it's not a really big specification in terms of message exchanges, as I was alluding earlier with MPI, which is a standard for distributed memory. This is the OpenMP standard for shared memory. So you see here, Pragma statements, OMP parallel would, for instance, mean I will have this particular part 
in a parallel region, although before that it would be serial. And in this region, I will do probably specific things in parallel, depends what it is, what we do in the application. Just a side comment also to open MPI, because now people are often confused. This was one of the exam questions all the time. So what's the difference between open MP and open MPI? They are on different levels and not directly related at all. So MPI is a standard for distributed memory and open MPI is an implementation of that, right? That's what we used, if you remember, in the earlier lectures of GNU, um, also open MPI, we, we loaded these modules. So they are implementations of the MPI standard. Open MP is something completely different. It's a specification and implementation of this compiler directives and has nothing to do with open MPI in one respect, right? So of course it's all for parallel programming, uh, it's libraries that you use. So be careful when you think about open MPI versus open MP. So much for the experience because people often confuse these two things. Um, understanding better the parallel and serial regions, why I should do this, um, how I can do this forks, uh, which are basically performed by the master thread uh, as I was alluding to here earlier. You see here another example where you do this, um, where the lifeline of the master thread is always basically there, but it also is important to understand that the master thread is not just the manager, right? And this, that spawns now three, re three threads here. You see basically it become itself one of the parallel, you know, forker threads that is working. Yeah, so this is quite important to understand that this is not just the manager that says here, please, please do the work and I will remain while I get your results back. This is really something who also will, you know, get the hands dirty, so to speak, as a manager here and will also be part of the threads. However, will also then be important for keeping the results and maybe kickstart another parallel region with different threads and, and so forth and so forth. I think this is just good to understand that um, firstly, the number of threads in all of these different regions can be different. And basically, that's important. And uh, essentially, the, the kind of a master thread is concurrently all the time there, actively participating in all those parallel regions, which is also important. So coming further then to um, the OpenMP standard, when you think about why is it so important to have a standard on this, again, basically when you want to see HPC machine A and HPC machine B, um, you would think about, okay, let's do this and port this application. And you see in many of these applications that we have in scientific computing, um, you would have then essentially the idea that this can be relatively straightforward, um, you know, um, ported, right? So that means, in other words, the co code that you have, the parallel code, the C code, for example, or Fortran, um, is basically compilable. Um, again, what we had similar um, in the idea of MPI, you can also nicely port. Always be careful what that means in terms of performance, right? I mean, the, the RAM could be in the architectures of the new system that you port to much more advanced. It could be larger. It could be, you know, um, different levels of caches, which then enables a whole application to be faster. This kind of portability is, of course, not saying that the same performance is there, but there's a highly likelihood that the code, you know, will compile relatively easily. And today, this is not always completely true. Um, you see also the portability, for instance, to a quantum computer is uh, basically not really on there today, right? So you see also this portability definitely has limits in the fields of HPC and quantum computing, especially these days. Um, however, there are concepts of OpenMP that more and more go into the field of accelerators, which we will also talk about. And then thinking about how to combine all of this with hierarchical hybrid computers, um, where you would say, and we alluded to this already, that's more like it looks like today. You would have these nodes that we talked about, um, where we want to do then this highly scalable infinibent network and the very large scale up of all these different racks with all the different nodes. And I want to lose all of them uh, basically in my computing. You heard this already. 
Um, and how it works is basically you would do MPI not within the node. Um, that doesn't make sense at all because it would be very slow. You would copy the, the, the memory again with the same buffer we had in the send and receive operation, if you remember. That makes absolutely no sense. Hence, the advantage is here directly at really reaching out to the shared address space or to the single address space where everybody has access to. Hence, um, you would basically do it the other way, um, where you would say, and I just should mention the Praise uh, portal. He has lots of tutorials available. It's currently transformed into a EuroHPC world as well, where you have tutorials already on OpenMPI, uh, OpenMP and MPI programming in parallel together. So you would program basically these kind of ideas of having distributed, comp uh, distributed memory combined with the shared memory. Um, this could look like that you basically do essentially MPI, as you see here, suggested across the nodes, right? Because you don't have access to memory um, directly, you basically would mo always have to go via the network to these different other nodes, and you would perform open MP, so shared memory programming within the node, right? And this is something which would be uh, quite a standard today. Uh, and this is often done. And basically, here is one application example again. What I want to show you here with the DB scan or the HP DB scan. We talked already about the MPI um, version of it on one data set, which was basically tail off in performance here already with 512 nodes. But we see the hybrid implementations, hybrid in the sense of combining threads uh, of OpenMP together with MPI statements for different data sets here actually scale much more near linear and then tail off at some point in time. And you see also that means we have to do new elements into the job script, and we will talk about this in part two much more, and basically then also CPUs per task. So we have to do some elements much more detailed than just nodes and number of tasks and so on, basically what we had in the MPI world. Uh, but more of this we also learn in the second part, I just want to show you a little bit at the end of part one, where basically more more future elements of programming these ideas going to. It's more and more basically with OMS and OpenMP um, developments in parallel in the D project, for instance, a task way of thinking, because you have certain tasks that might be very good for the CPU and you use a shared memory. They are very good elements, however, also for a GPU, and then you would use a device memory of an accelerator, right? So hence shared memory would be in the host memory CPU here. But as we now have available device memories and then GPUs that work on this device memory, we could think about a more task level approach of thinking how I can now use all of these pragma um, statements. Now you, you see device CUDA, which means a GPU of NVIDIA with the CUDA drivers and so on, to copy in the data. We learned also that usually from the host memory, we need to firstly basically bring things into the device memory and then compute there and then download it again to the host memory, which you see a little bit of copy out here of this statement, right? So the details on this is not so important. It just saying different variables and so on should be then going from the device memory to the host memory, which is then basically the inputs that we first have to copy in via the main memory to the device memory. Then the computing will start and the copy out of the answer would be back to the host memory. And this is something which you see already with OMP, the different standards took more and more of the OMS idea of tasks and so on into the game. We will talk more about GPU programming in that context a little bit making it more and more simpler for application developer to not differentiating anymore between accelerator programming and what is now the idea of shared memory programming. I actually want to have more or less a task executed wisely. And you see already how that works when you have now a production implementation, because in many of the applications that we know, um, actually the parallelization approach and the whole idea of executing is more and more gaining something like a tree or a workflow, right, between the different tasks. And when you can create such a workflow, you can much more easier simply um, here and there parallelize it. So in order to have the maximum performance, instead of just fixing to one idea, maybe parts of it could be already running on the accelerator while other parts use a shared memory much more. 
And hence, we have to do some more extension to the language with OMP parallel, do OMP atomic, um, and basically do here different statements um, for, for could be, you know, elements of parallelizing uh, certain parts of the applications here in different areas, or as you would see here, suggesting that basically one application, what you see here, is more or less, again, sort of a workflow where there are different dependencies between all of them. Um, between all the different tasks. And this is something to think about in the future more and more um, with PyComs is even a Python idea how to do this, a very nice API developed in Barcelona by colleagues. Um, something where we see that this traditional, let's say, programming, which is very, let's say, uh, based on shared memory, on MPI with um, distributed memory and then on CUDA programming, for accelerators, which we learn more in lecture six in the accelerator world, it's getting more and more complex. And one of the ideas is rather thinking about a framework that can cross all of these different heterogeneous aspects. But still, we are not there in this world. You see here one example of OpenMP. Many of the application codes you will find today are just MPI OpenMP based. More newer ones extending also to CUDA, obviously to accelerators, but still having let's say a broad adoption of the task, we will probably see also in the future, especially towards extra scale when we are different modular systems. But that's all what I wanted to encourage you to look to you um, to look at today. This ocean wave simulation is one CFD aspect that we will also see in the later parts of this lecture by Reza. And we will continue in 10 minutes. So see you then. <laughs>